Good morning, everyone. We are back and uh, back with Liz from Normandy Equine in Normandy, France. And um, I so enjoy all these, these, these lives here that we have because we are learning so much and our goal is really to, um, to get you involved, and to get you thinking about what Liz is talking about. So today we are going to talk about straight versus alignment and how can you get your horse straight on a circle? I know that sounds like an oxymoron to me, but that's what we want. And I'm going to let Liz talk about it. Be sure to put in the comments where you join us from, whether you watch the replay or live. Uh, give us some love, give us, give us some likes, share our, our message, uh, because we need, this to, we need to get this out to the world ASAP. Um, we are planning big things. We're planning for Liz to come to the United States sooner rather than later, because God knows I need help with my horse. <laughs> and, um, and a lot of us need help with our horses. And then we are planning as well. And we'll, we'll get you um, tuned into that. We are planning as well a, a big get together in Normandy, France next year. But more about that later. So with all further, um, without further notice, um, go for it, Liz. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> it's yours. Great. Okay. Well, hi, hi again. So you're probably thinking, like, how long is she going to, you know, go on and on about this alignment and about um, uh, straightness and all of that? It is one of the most crucial steps in the development of a horse, or in the rehabilitation of a horse, or re-education of a horse is to teach them um, how to use their bodies for our purposes. So horses use their bodies for their own purposes without any trouble whatsoever. So what we're doing here, and the reason why we are going very slowly step by step through this is so that you can really grasp the concepts behind this and, and the anatomy behind it. So we're gonna do a little recap. So first of all, what we've gone over is, is uh, horizontal alignment, which you now know the three points, which is the occipital, occipital bone, the, the top of the wither and the tuber sacrali. So you've even got the pictures to go with that. We've looked at vertical alignment, which is uh, all to do with the sternum and the facial crests of the horse. Um, we've also talked about uh, physical things that you can do at home. So the shopping cart, uh, where you go and demonstrate to yourself how a horse becomes one-sided and the reason why he, he becomes one-sided is because he deviates through his shoulder in one way so that way where he is actually deviating um, the opposing circle would be easy to do but the one where his shoulder is actually already where you want to go makes it a lot more difficult so if you've been uh, to the shopping uh, to the supermarket, I mean, and you've done that, you, you will have felt yourself what, what that feels like to the horse. Um, we've also sent you to the yard with the um, lovely figures from, or the lovely pictures from the anatomy book that I mentioned earlier, uh, so that you could feel the, the structures that we're concerned with. So even if you're a therapist, even if you're a vet, even if you're someone really, really, really in tune with anatomy, it's good to go back and have a look at these structures with a different view in mind, with a different purpose in mind, not just to know where they are or what their function is, but also how they can start to function together to give you a better understanding of how your horse um, needs to be educated so that he knows what to do for you which is really, really important for their mental well-being. Um, and then, of course, looking at the bottom line differentials. So I've, um, just to remind you of that, I'm just going to put it up this way so that you can see. I won't flip the image around. But this particular horse is actually quite well balanced. If you look at the elbow, which is where we are right here, and then you go up to the stifle, there's not much difference, okay? There is a slight difference. This is higher, this is lower. But it's a very easy way for you to look at your horse and really understand that if this is much higher than that, even though this and this is relatively equal, 
your horse is downhill. He is going to be having to cope with um, not only the fact that he's shorter in front than he is behind, and all of this is the pushing power that is pushing him onto a shorter structure, but the weight of this thoracic cage here is gonna be sliding forward, which means he's gonna be wanting to keep his head, as this horse is, quite high up. Now, if you look at horses in the field, or if you look at horses um, galloping even on the racetrack, they do not have their head down. The head down concept comes Sorry, I'm getting a phone call from a friend who is probably lost trying to find me. Um, so anyway, um, so you've had all of this now to sort of really get your mind working its way around what it is that we're trying to get you to do um, and to understand. Our, and um, sorry, is a friend trying to get a hold of me? She's supposed to be coming here. Uh, to do some work with me. So um, anyway, so the question that we're now going to ask you is why do we care about alignment in horses? Why do we want our horses to be aligned? Are they, you know, what, what is the benefit to us? Um, and more importantly, as far as I'm concerned, what is the benefit to them? So in more traditional terms, because we're going to plot back and forth between uh, traditional and you know and the new model coming out um you know why do we care about straightness you know why are we taught from from a very young age as riders that we need to maintain straightness within our horses um and a lot of riders are taught about straightness but are not there's not much of an explanation as to why the horse needs to be straight so, and the, the thing that is even more complex for the human brain to grasp is how do we get something straight when we're riding it on a circle? That is a real sort of mind bender. Um, and a lot of you out there probably have, you know, wondered about that or maybe haven't wondered about it, but certainly have dealt with the negative sides of what happens when a horse is crooked on a circle and when a horse is crooked on his line. If you're a dressage rider, you've tried to you know, ride that center line and your horse is doing this the whole way, or if you're a show jumper and you're trying to come to the middle of the fence, but the horse is galloping sideways as you're trying to pull it back to the center of the fence, or if you're an event rider like I used to be, and you know, you're coming up to this very big question and your horse again is starting to fly away from the very point that you want to bring him to is not exactly a comfortable feeling for you. Also, as dressage riders, you know, when you're trying to show off your beautiful lateral work and it goes absolutely perfectly to the left, but secretly you're dying inside because you know you're going to have to also show it to the right. And when you go to the right, it all of a sudden all falls apart. Or you're trying to, to you know, present a beautiful piaf, but the piaf is really lovely on one diagonal and completely not expressive on the other. You know, why is all of that happening? Well, all of that happens because the horse is not aligned <laughs> or in traditional terms, he isn't straight. So he isn't using his body in a way that is equal on both sides. So you end up with disparity, which is not good for the rider in competition, but really bad for the horse. Because eventually, if you keep using a structure, uh, whether it's a mechanical structure like a car or a biological structure like your own body, if you use it incorrectly, it will break. Now, it, I can't tell you when it will break, but I can tell you that eventually something will go wrong. Your back will go out. I know a lot of you can probably um, remember times when you just bent over to pick something up and you couldn't get up again <laughs> because your back went out. That doesn't happen like that. People say to me, but I wasn't doing anything very bad. No, of course you weren't, but it doesn't happen in one go. It's repetitive motion, repeated misuse of your perfect body that you keep misusing, 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 misusing. And one day the machine goes, 
I can't do this anymore. And it tells you stop. Well, the same thing happens for horses. The same thing happens for any um, machine, whether it's bio machine or whether it's a mechanical machine. Um, so we're going to start to look at, at some pictures today. And, and I really want you to get an idea of, of the structure of the horse's back. We tend to spend a lot of time fascinated by horses' backs as though they're the one structure that the rider uh, really needs to concern itself with. Well, that's not really true because actually, I think we, we, we concern ourselves with the back of the horse because we sit on it and because so many horses have uh, back problems. But really, the one thing I want you to, to, to be very aware of, and which is why I gave you the homework of going out to look at photographs or, pick, or horses in the field of them lying down or standing um, at rest, is that we're going to look at how they do this themselves. So I'm going to flip us around again, my little perfect, there we go. Okay, so here you go, you've got um, this is on my on my screen. So you've got one horse here uh, lying down very comfortably um, and he's about as curled up as a horse can be. He's all tucked under and he is in a position that we call sternal and the reason that it's called sternal is because he's sitting on his sternum. So there's the sternum right there and that's what he's sitting on or lying on if you like. So he's sternal in that in that position here. Okay, and this horse is perfect because you can really see the line of his spine. So all along here, you can go from the wither all the way down to here and see that spine. Well, let me tell you, if he could curl up anymore, he would because horses, just like any other animal, like to be curled up. We like that fetal position. It gives us a really sort of good sense of security. But he can't because his back is really, really... Um, you know, it has no lateral bend to it. I mean, people will argue with me that there is lateral bend and, and they're correct, but it's so tiny that it really doesn't influence, uh, you know, what we would like, you, you know, what we're thinking about when we're doing um, circles and things. It does not come from the fact that the horse's back can bend. So we're going to now look at horse is that are, uh, um, so that's another one that's just lying down there. That gives you an idea. Now this horse is lying absolutely flat out. So this is a horse that is sleeping for REM sleep, so rapid eye movement sleep, where the was literally the body and the brain disconnect from each other. The horse has to be able to lie flat out. Um, they can't do this standing up. They can doze and rest standing up, but they cannot actually get the proper amount of sleep that they need, where the brain and body separate, if you like, um, unless they're lying flat out. My horse used to do this at competitions, and I'd always get these calls over the loudspeaker because people were worried that because he would love to snore. <laughs> um, now this horse is blank. Liz, you're breaking this up. Horse from uh, the back and the spine, it comes absolutely from the neck. The neck is extremely flexible, and this is how this horse is getting to the back flank. It also to show the flexibility of the neck. And then same thing with this horse, really coming up behind to scratch her bum. It's not happening within her back. It is absolutely happening within her neck. So this is all stuff that you really need to take into consideration because structures are not alterable. You can't have something bent that doesn't bend. Um, and this all comes into line with what we're gonna do with the straightness on the circles. Now these horses are dozing. These are horses that are standing, but resting. And what you're going to notice again is that when they go into this position to rest, they are all in alignment. There's not one of them. These three very different horses, very heavy draft horse there. This is sort of like a you know bigger pony, smaller horse, could be any kind of breed. And then you've got a little pony at the bottom. All of them go into very square, very aligned, 
you can tell on the money the you've got the occiput and then the wither and then the croup all aligned so that they can remain in balance. And that is the crucial point of all of this is that we want horses in balance. We're going to look at these next photos a little further on. Okay. So, oops, I have back. So the big reason why we are looking for alignment is because first gateway to balance. When your horse's shoulders are moving from one side to the other and creating deformation of their bodies. It's also creating deformation within their ability to balance. It also stops them from being able to give you a rhythm and it certainly stops them from being ambidextrous. They can't do, they can't be stuck in this posture here and give you two circles in different directions in the same way. Um, so, when we ask horses to perform circles, we are taking them out of their normal way of doing things. They don't, so I call this extraordinary demands on their bodies because ordinary demands is what they would do normally themselves. Anything that is above and beyond that, so for a human being, maybe dancing would be extraordinary or learning how to play tennis would be extraordinary because it's out of our normal use of our bodies. So when we're doing this for our horses or we're asking them to do this, um, We've got to be very careful how we how we develop those skills because it is not normal. We've become so used to horses being broken that we we um, that that it's we we've become desensitized to the fact that horses' tendons break or that their backs are sore or so those are not normal and they are avoidable. Um, so this is another reason why we want to really teach horses how to be in alignment when we are asking them to do things like circles and straight lines. Circles and straight lines are not part of their remit, they're not part of their normal way of moving. Um, and then what happens when the horse is out of al alignment, so loss of balance is one of them, loss of rhythm is, is the second uh, thing that happens, the horse can no longer be in rhythm, so instead of having a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, regular beat at the walk, you would have a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, depending on how the horse is moving. Uh, loss of confidence, horses that are out of balance are definitely not confident. Uh, they'd be in compensation and there would be definitely a degradation of the system. So the system starts breaking down because the horse is no longer using it, using the system correctly. Uh, for the rider, uh, a horse that is at, not straight or not in alignment is um, sitting on a base that is very unsteady. We talked a little bit about building blocks the other day where when you were a child you might have used the blocks to build houses and things and if the base is not steady eventually the whole structure falls down. Well the same thing happens um, when we're sitting on a horse, but for us, when we're sitting on a horse who's crooked, our conscious, our instincts are going to kick in and we are going to try to fix that problem. It feels awful. It's very precarious when you're up there and you're, you're not feeling steady or supported by, by the horse that you're sitting on. And what you try to do is you, you try to, to re-establish this balance that you're seeking yourself. And Unfortunately, what it does to us, it makes us body deform, it makes us stiffen, it makes us lean, it makes us pull on the horse, it makes us kick on its flanks, trying to get this base that we're sitting on to reestablish a more comfortable uh, base for us to be on. Um, and a horse who is already fighting for his balance, of course, when you then try to reestablish something out of something that's already dysfunctional, he will be fighting you every step of the way because he will feel really uncomfortable with the idea of you trying to pull him out of the balance that he's managed to establish. So now you're leading, both of you are being led into conflict and that is definitely not where you want to be. So, we're finally going to get to the point where we're going to put this all into practical use 
And for the homework for today, and I am going to show you a couple of more pictures, but for the homework for today, I would really love for you to go to the barn or yard, put your horse on the lunge line and start just letting him go to the end of the lunge line and make three circles around you and watch the shoulders, watch where those circles are going. Is the horse falling in on you? Is the horse leaving you? Is the horse uh, pulling on you? Where, where is it all, you know, where are those shoulders going? Because you'll start to notice that the circle that we would love for it to just you put your horse on the, on the lunge line and it just goes around you without any pulling or any leaning towards you, any coming into your space doesn't occur naturally. You've got to be able to teach your horse how to do that. And the first thing we're gonna do is observe the shoulders. Where are they going in? Where are they going out? And what are the influences? Is it an external influence? Is the horse afraid of something that's making him come towards you? Is the horse attracted to something that is making him go away from you? Is it the ground that you're working on? Try to start thinking about these different things because they're all incredibly crucial to um, what's gonna come next, which is, how to do all of this ridden, but the first work comes in hand. Um, and just to finish, what you've got to understand is that horses don't make circles in, in the wild. So when they're changing direction, I've got something quite interesting. So when they're changing direction, if you look at the picture on top, they tend to lean. So if you look at this horse right here, his shoulder is really leaning and then his head is coming back this way to counterbalance. So that is a horse that is crooked, but he doesn't care because he's using his body for his own devices without a rider on top of him trying to do anything. This horse here is doing the same, really leaning. Perhaps he's got his head back over towards the other direction so that he can counterbalance with his head. And keep looking, all these heads are way up. There's not one of them galloping along with his head down. So this is how a horse in nature finds his own balance. But for us, riding those horses uh, would be really uncomfortable, especially if we're trying to do a beautiful dressage test. Now, this picture here I took years ago, um, several years ago. This is a rider at a one-star FEI competition, show jumping competition. And as you can see, this horse has not been taught how to balance, how to remain on, up on all four of its feet and how to use alignment. This is a horse that had to, from that position, turn left, find the path to the, to the fence and jump it out of that position, which I can tell you was not, uh, very comfortable for him. So again, just to illustrate a little bit why it is that we want our horses and how we're going to teach them how to do it on a circle. So the first step for you to discover how to get this alignment or straightness on a circle is going to be by you um, just observing that horse on the end of the lunge line and make notes, you know, at what point does he come in? When does he go out? And then see if you can make a straight line at a five to 10 meter distance away from him. Can you walk and have him stay that five to 10 meters distance away from you uh, without deviating towards you or pulling away from you? So that's the homework. Um, I hope that, again, some of these words have gone a little deeper into the psyche so that you're starting to understand why these structures are so important and what happens uh, when they're being misused. Um, and hopefully we'll get some questions as well. Some Anybody that wants any questions answered. Um, and next week we're going to talk a little bit about once you've observed your horse, how we're going to uh, fix or teach, which is a better word, your horse how not to keep deviating on the circle on the lunge line. Okay, so that's it for today. I hope that you enjoyed that and uh, we'll see you next time.
Monique. <laughs> Monique, yeah. that's it. Uh, I really enjoyed that. That was really great, great information. I hope all of you enjoyed that as well. And take it to the barn. Um, I'm going to play with my horse. <laughs> Get him on a circle and see where he comes to me or where he stops or where he goes out. And I've done it a few times before. And it depends a little bit on whether it's food time or time to go out or whether there's other horses around um, or whether he just thinks that he needs a snack or a hug. Um, but a lot of, the, you know, it's, it's interesting to see because I like that. I like that a lot that um, we, we will keep doing that. So again, let us know where you joined us from um, and, and ask some questions and remember the person that interacts the most every month uh, by sharing, commenting, asking questions, liking, etc., uh, wins a, uh, a bag designed by Liz uh, for the love of horses and an hour long uh, free consultation for you and your horse. So awesome. Have a great day and we will post when we're going to be back. Bye, Monique. Bye. <laughs>